Um, first of all, welcome to this session. Thank you so much for making the time to join us today. I hope everybody is uh, staying safe and healthy um, in these uh, weird times we live in. Today, we're gonna to be talking about real-time indexing and how you can use it as a serverless low ops alternative to Elasticsearch. My name is Shruti Bhatt. I am head of product here at Rockset, and I have with me my co-presenter, Ben Hagen. Ben. Hi, everyone. Yes, I'm a solutions architect here at uh, Rockset, and before that, I was a solutions architect at Elastic. Um, so my history over many years has been in big data analytics and uh, scaling distributed systems. Awesome. And a quick look at the agenda today. Um, now, most of you are very familiar with search indexing. You're familiar with Elasticsearch. Today, we're going to compare and contrast search indexing with real-time converged indexing. We'll talk about uh, what converged indexing is, how it's similar, how it's different, how the architecture is set up. And then we'll also um, go over some of the details in terms of how is it different uh, in terms of operations. You know, when you talk about serverless systems, cloud native systems, there's a huge advantage that we have um, in the cloud. And we really want to spend some time talking about how does that look uh, in terms of initial setup, in terms of day two operations. And, you know, since Ben has uh, spent many, many hours helping uh, Elasticsearch customers size their environments, we're lucky to have him um, lend his expertise here. So let's get started. Um, search indexing, as you all know, has been around for a while. As we looked at where search indexing started, its roots um, in text search, and then over time, all the different use cases that it's uh, being used for. We looked at some design goals in terms of designing Rockset and designing converged indexing a little differently. So one of our primary goals here is how do we get better scaling in, this, in the cloud? The second one is more flexibility especially now with in the last few years with how data has changed, how the shape of the data coming from many different places tends to be completely different and how it's being used for very different types of applications. How do we give you more schema query flexibility? And the last one is around low ops. So given these design goals, just uh, setting the context here that as far as speed at scale is concerned, we're looking at new data being queryable in about two seconds, P95 of two seconds, even if you have millions of writes, of, uh, writes per second coming in. At the same time, we also want to make sure that queries return in milliseconds, even on terabytes of data. Now, of course, this is possible today with Elasticsearch, right? Elastic is used at very high scale. The challenge, though, is managing it at that scale becomes very, very difficult. So when we talk about better scaling, what we mean is how do we enable this type of scaling in the cloud while making it very easy? The second piece is for flexibility, we heard feedback loud and clear that you want to be able to do a lot more uh, complex queries. You want to be able to do, for example, you know, standard SQL queries, say, you know, including joins on whatever your data is, wherever it's coming from. It could be nested JSON coming from MongoDB. It could be Avro coming from Kafka. It could be Parquet coming from S3 or structured data coming from other places. So how can you run any types of complex queries on this without having to denormalize your data. That's one of the design goals. And the last one is where we'll spend a lot more time in today's session, which is low ops. When you build a cloud native system, you can enable serverless cloud scaling and the, the vectors we're optimizing for are both hardware efficiency and human efficiency in the cloud. You know, for example, um, you know, uh, memory is very expensive in the cloud. Um, you know, managing clusters and 
Now, scaling up and down is painful when you have a lot of bursty workloads. So how can we handle all of that in a more simple way in the cloud? So these are the three design goals we're gonna talk about um, and we're gonna show you how we achieve this today. But let's take a deep dive into really what is the difference between the two indexing technologies. Search indexing, as you all know, is inverted, uh, it's, you know, Elasticsearch has an inverted index and it also has doc value storage built using Apache Lucene. Lucene has been around for a while, it's open source, we're all intimately familiar with it. It was originally built for text search and log analytics, and this is something it really shines at. Um, it also means that you have to denormalize your data as you put your data in, and you get very fast search and aggregation queries. Converged indexing though, you can think of it as the next generation of indexing. What we do here is we combine the search index, so we're combining the inverted index with a row-based index and a column store. And then all of this is built on top of a key value abstraction, not Lucene. This is built on top of RocksDB. What does that lend itself really well to? Because of the kind of flexibility and scale that it gives you, it lends itself really well to real-time analytics and real-time applications. And the advantage here is if you're doing this kind of real-time analytics, you don't need to denormalize your data and you basically get really fast search, aggregation, time-based queries because you know by default you now have a, a time index built here, geo queries because you have a geo index and your joins are also possible and not only are they possible, they're really fast. So that's in a nutshell, the difference between search and converged indexing. A quick look at what converged indexing looks like under the hood, right? We talked about having your columnar inverted and row index in the same system. If you were to conceptually visualize it, you can think of it as, um, you know, your document that comes in is shredded and mapped to many keys and values. And when it's stored in terms of many keys and values, it kind of internally looks like this. So you have your column store, you have your row store, and you have your inverted index. And then we store all of this on RocksDB. RocksDB is an embedded um, key value store. Uh, in fact, ours is the team that built it. If you're not familiar with RocksDB, I'll give you a, a one second um, overview. So our team built RocksDB uh, back at Facebook and opened open sourced it. Today you will find RocksDB is used in Apache Kafka, it's used in Flink, it's used in uh, CockroachDB, like all the modern cloud scale distributed systems use RocksDB. So we also use RocksDB under the hood and it's a very different representation than you know, what is done in Elasticsearch. One of the big differences here is that because you have these three different types of indexes, we can have now a SQL optimizer that decides in real time which is the best index to use and then returns your queries really fast by picking the right index and optimizing your query in real time. And because this is a key value store, the other advantage you have is that each and every field is mutable. What does this mutability give you as you scale? It basically means you don't have to ever worry about re-indexing as you get, uh, you know, if you're using, for example, um, you know, database change streams, you don't have to worry about what happens when you have a lot of upsorts coming in, you have updates, deletes, inserts in your uh, database change data capture. You don't have to worry about how that's handled um, in your index. So every individual field being mutable is very powerful as you start scaling your system, as you have you know, massive scale indexes. Ben is gonna talk about this uh, in more detail as we go through the rest of the presentation. But now that we talked about converged indexing and search indexing, let's zoom out for a second and say, okay, so now we have these two uh, types of indexes, right? You either have search indexing built on Lucene or you have converged indexing built on RocksDB. 
what else is the difference between Elasticsearch and Rockset? There is uh, another big difference, which is that the query language in the case of Rockset is standard SQL, including joins. In the case of Elasticsearch, you know, you're all familiar with the query DSL. Um, the other thing is Elastic has um, a tightly integrated Elk stack, so you would use Kibana for visualization. And of course, Elastic is available on-prem or it can be cloud hosted. The difference on the Rockset side is because we support standard SQL, we don't have any one particular visualization tool that we're tied to. We support all the standard SQL tools and SQL visualization um, uh, tools like Tableau, Grafana, Redash, uh, you pick your favorite SQL tool. And the other difference is that we have a lot of developers using Rockset to build applications. So we obsess about the developer experience, we obsess about the developer workflows and how do we integrate into CI CD. So we have you know, things like query lambdas, which again, we'll talk about uh, as we do the demo, but you can think of query lambdas as a, a saved named SQL query that you can just trigger um, and use it as an API. So all of these um, concepts are slightly different we will compare and contrast the approach to managing Elasticsearch or managing Rockset and see how that impacts your workflows. And by the end of the session, um, hopefully you'll have a very clear picture of how your world would look different if you were to use Elastic or Rockset. All right, so some of the use cases that we see on the Rockset side, right? It's really interesting. Um, when you bring in event streams, when you bring in user behavior data, sensor data, device metrics, again, the kicker here is that you have many different formats, right? You have nested JSON, Avro, Parquet, XML, geostructured data. How can you search and analyze this type of data in real time? And what would you use it for? The most common use cases we see are ad optimization, A-B testing, fraud detection, real-time 360, and oftentimes these look like live dashboards. However, it doesn't stop there. When you start doing this in the cloud, you also see more interesting real-time applications coming in, things like logistics, fleet tracking, gaming leaderboards, personalization, real-time recommendations. And this is why, you know, when you think about these types of applications, we also spend a lot of time optimizing it for not just live dashboards, but also developer workflows and actually making it a core part of your app dev lifecycle. So I think the, the big difference is that if you're only using Elasticsearch for text search or you're only using Elasticsearch for log analytics, it probably serves you really well because that's, that's the core of Elastic. That's what it was built for. And you know, over the last 10 years or so, it's become a fantastic text search engine. But as we're all familiar, over time, Elastic has been used for more and more use cases. And if you're one of those people who's using Elasticsearch for all of the other things, right? Not just text search, but also for um, you know, real-time analytics across event streams and user behavior and sensor data and device metrics, or if you're offloading um, you know, data from your primary database into Elastic for aggregations, well, that's where you will see in the rest of the presentation the, the advantages that converged indexing brings in will be really interesting for you. So with that, let me hand it over to Ben so he can show you a demo of what this actually looks like. Thanks, Ruti. Yeah, so what I'm gonna do is just take you through um, a brief demonstration of what Rockset actually looks like. So for those of you who haven't seen it, um, <clears throat> just an end-to-end -end kind of use case for uh, uh, just to bring you up to speed on how it works. So hopefully you can see my browser dashboard here. Um, you know, as we've already sort of described, Rockset is a complete, um, uh, fully managed SaaS environment. So there's no downloads, there's no installs, there's no plugins. Um, you simply sign up, create yourself an account, and, and you're kind of good to go. 
Now, if I click onto this collection side on the left here, what you'll see is this um, collections are effectively analogous to tables or indexes, you know, depending on what system you're using, but analogous to a table in kind of a relational system. Um, now, much like Elastic, I think, you know, Rockset is effectively an indexing system and we very much focus on allowing people to get data into the platform easily. Um, and as you'll see, each collection has a source associated with it here. So these are integrations into upstream data sources, be it DynamoDB or S3 or um, you know, things like Kafka. Um, and these all, um, most of these are kind of click and connect integrations. And let me click into one of these. Let's have a look. If I go onto this Kafka feed here, which we'll take a bit of a deep dive on, <clears throat> and this gives you um, some interesting insights as to how Rockset actually works. So first of all, all of the fields that are coming into this um, collection via this Kafka stream, we've got a real-time Kafka stream coming in. It's actually Twitter data, um, just out of curiosity. And on the left-hand side here, you'll see all of the fields that are coming in as part of those documents. And you can see we've got about 1,200 um, per document. So <clears throat> it's pretty much standard Twitter data, but this is all um, deeply nested JSON data in this case. And you can see that Rockset automatically, like Elastic, you know, automatically type maps this data um, and it handles kind of the messy data well. So, you know, all the advantages you want from a NoSQL system where I can, you know, I can change my schema, I can throw in different types, maybe the same values coming in as a, as a string or as an integer that shouldn't, you know, cause any problems or, or, or you know, break any inbound um, ingestion streams. And that's exactly the case in Rockset. So, you know, we really see a huge amount of benefit where people don't have to build ingestion pipelines, where you're not having to kind of do that acrobatics of formatting my data and, um, you know, bringing in other sources. It's just, you know, ingest the data as it is in whatever format. And on the right hand side, this is where we start to see some of the real benefits um, kind of above and beyond just a standard NoSQL environment in that, you know, as Shruti mentioned, what we're actually doing under the covers is we're slicing up every key and value from every document into the platform and storing that individually. But what we actually give you back as kind of a consumer or a user of this data is this tabular representation. So it's really cool that you can come in here and sort of look at this um, JSON, you know, nested data, but in sort of a tabular representation. And you can see I've got these sort of deeply nested objects and arrays. Um, so it, you know, from a usability perspective, it's then really simple to come in and, and start querying that data, which we'll get onto in a moment. The other key things here, if I go ahead and create a new collection, let's um, click on the create collections. I'm creating a new one. Basically says like, where's my upstream data coming from? You know, is it gonna be from a change data capture stream or just the API or um, and so on and so forth. And if I pick Kafka, cause that's what we're, we're looking at today and I've got a Kafka connect integration here. You can see a number of properties that we can set on a table or on a collection. Um, and if I just drill into my Kafka topic, you can see that, um, you know, much the same way as you can in Elastic, you can actually do sorts of um, manipulations on the data as it comes into the platform. So, you know, I can actually run custom mappings and, and fully fledged SQL on that data as it comes in to do things like type casting. Um, or maybe I want to do some lookups in other, um, you know, other tables and, and bring that data in. So, you know, there's, um, I can, I can drop fields or documents. So all sorts of data manipulation you can do at ingest time, just using you know, native SQL. And then one of the other key parts about, um, a collection is the ability to set a, a retention policy on this. And we'll, we'll touch on, on this in more detail a bit later, but you know, I can drop these documents automatically after a certain period of time, bit days, weeks, hours, months, whatever you, you, you need. Um, so that allows you to, on a per collection basis, just automatically expire data that you no longer want to query. Maybe it's no longer kind of in that hot tier where you want to, uh, you know, it's primary importance and uh, and want to keep that on this instance. And then at the bottom here, we've actually got um, what instance type we're running on. And we're going to come onto this in a lot more detail, so I won't spend too much time here. So once your collection is created, the data starts flowing in and, you know, the platform keeps that in synchronization. So Rockset will keep synchronized with the upstream, upstream data source without doing any manipulation, any, any config, any setup. Um, you know, it will do that for you. But let's dig into this, this collection a bit further. 
And I'm going to hit this query button on the right hand side here. And this is where you're effectively dropped into your, um, you know, your full SQL interface. And going back to that kind of relational schema representation, you can see here, I can just start querying that data in, in you know, kind of as you would expect with SQL. I like a browse across all the different fields of my different collections here, um, you know, which is nice for doing things like joins and stuff. You can easily drop these fields in. And I've got an example here on that Twitter data. Um, three examples, actually. Let's, let's run this first one here. And what you'll see is this is a simple select and it's looking at our specific field, Twitter Firehose. And you'll see it's pulled out this entities field, which is an array of objects in this case. Um, pretty simple stuff. And I've said, you know, let's look at the last day. And my second query here, if I run this one, um, what we're doing here is using this unnest command, which just blows out that Twitter, the ticker symbol specifically, that was in those deeply nested um, array of objects into its own columnar representation effectively. And using that, we can easily then run joins on this nested uh, JSON data. So the final query here, um, what I'm actually doing is we're doing a join on this ticker symbol here. And of course, we're looking at our live Kafka data that's coming into the platform um, in real time. And if I scroll down, you'll just see I'm using a standard SQL join to join between another collection, which happens to be coming from S3 in this case. It could be any other data source. And so I'm actually using the company name and industry um, joining on the ticker symbol coming from a different data source. And then also I've got my live count coming through Kafka um, on the right hand side here. So you're kind of getting that real time kind of leaderboard style um, you know, uh, request here but you're also matching that up or, or joining with, uh, with an external, another data source, which is cool. And then the final piece of this is really kind of, you know, typically developers are really don't want to be in the, the display, the, the, the consoles we're looking at here. Typically they're in their own IDEs. Um, they're thinking about, you know, source control around the SQL, how it gets integrated with CI CD um, and how that gets versioned. And that's really where um, our query lambdas come into to play. So if I take, let's remove these, let's just have one query here. And I'm going to hit this create query lambda button. And what this does is, if I give this a creative name, it effectively wraps the SQL up and gives it a version and makes it addressable via HTTP. So we, we almost give it a little microservice endpoint where you can trigger the execution of the SQL query just via HTTP. So of course our client libraries support this, um, but anything you know, any sort of HTTP uh, resources you can, you know, you can now integrate with your SQL. And we can see the definition here. I can also add parameters. So if I want to, of course, you know, change things like user IDs or names or any other SQL parameter that you want to change that I pass in through an HTTP parameter, um, you can of course do that and, and place variables in here as well. As I mentioned, this is all version, so that you have a um, you know, when you're deploying into production, you can just update your versions as you need to. Um, so that's really how developers take, um, you know, a, a SQL query and then embed that into their real-time applications. Um, yeah, and there's actually a huge amount of tooling that sort of supports this and sits behind this. So that's definitely for another day. But, um, you know, if anyone's interested, there's, there's plenty of resources on YouTube and, of course, the, the Rockset documentation as well. Okay, so I'm going to leave the um, the demo there. Let's drop back to the slides, and what I'm going to so touch as on we briefly. go off the demo, just a quick reminder to everyone: we are taking questions on chat. So if you want to type in your questions on chat while uh, Ben is talking us through the rest of it, that'll be great, and we will take them as and when they come in. So back to you, Ben. Perfect. Thanks, Rudy. So I just wanted to touch briefly on <clears throat> the underlying architecture of, um, of Rockset. And of course, I'm guessing most people on this call are, are interested in, in what does that look like and how does it work? Um, so what you'll see here is we, we have this uh, architecture that we refer to as ALT, Aggregator Leaf Tailor. And you know uh, what it effectively does is it separates out um, ingest compute from storage compute from query compute. And that's really been the fundamental premise of how Rockset was developed from the start. Um, you know, these things fluctuate. They um, they obviously have different impacts on cost. 
Um, but the key thing here is everything you can see surrounded with the pink line is stuff that is actually managed by Roxette and that's managed by the platform. So these things can independently scale up and down um, based on your workloads. And then as we'll come on to in a moment, we can actually apply um, different compute resources to these to allow you to um, you know, re return or, or get the exact sort of performance to cost ratio that you require. So the tailors are responsible just at a really high level. Tailors are responsible for ingesting that data. Um, so as you just saw, whether we've got data coming from kind of change data capture streams or Kafka or you know, whatever it may be, they keep the data synchronized so that it's always being ingested and uh, you know they will scale up accordingly automatically to meet those requirements. Um, the leaf nodes are the actual storage nodes and that's where we talk about kind of hot cold um, storage and that's where you know the actual underlying rocks DB system is used. Um, that's kind of all abstracted away so it's not sort of um, something you have to interface with but uh, that's what's happening under the covers. And then finally, you know, when I'm querying this data, um, there's actually a two level aggregator um, query architecture whereby the queries are distributed and run in parallel. And that allows us to give, um, you know, that allows us to scale up that compute and to actually uh, increase the, the performance of those queries, um, you know, as you would expect in parallel. So if we look at the kind of the three sections of this really kind of you know getting set up getting started and then how do we scale how do we move into those bigger infrastructures those bigger clusters um, and in the elastic world sort of if we're looking specifically at the elastic cloud you can um, select and pick and choose between the um, the type of compute you require whether you have a you know a memory intensive application or a cpu intensive application or it's more generalist sort of a bit of both um, and the instance types are actually defined mapping the storage to memory ratios, um, which is optimal for the type of, of CPU instance that you're picking. You do need to think about um, capacity planning here, but it's very easy just to you know, scale this stuff up as we'll talk about in a bit, bit more as to you know, how much disk space do I need. And then the other thing to think about is um, the different node types that, that come into effect as you scale up your cluster. So do I need more specific master nodes or, or dedicated coordinator nodes? Um, so those things get introduced as you scale up your, your platform or your, your cluster you're designing. And on the Roxet side, um, as we just talked about, one of the key things is the storage auto scale. So whether you create an account while, you know, literally while we're on this call now and start throwing in, you know, tens of gigabytes, hundreds of gigabytes, terabytes, whatever it may be, um, there's no um there's no impact to that there's nothing you have to kind of understand or, or tune or change to to scale up the storage side that's all taken care of for, for you the way we actually manage the compute as in you know how much resources are actually allocated to my virtual instance um is done um, based on a number of cpus and a fixed ratio similar to to elastic on the amount of memory that's allocated to that as well um, and we'll get into that in, the, in a few moments so you can get a clearer picture of what that looks like. And then finally, on the one of the other key considerations here is cloud durability. So one of the things that we haven't sort of talked about in depth is the fact that when data comes into the platform, it gets moved onto that hot storage tier automatically, but it's also being backed up under the covers into an S3 um, storage environment. So you have this built-in durability for resilience, um, kind of core, core part of the infrastructure. Um, one of the very um, recent innovations that we have, which we're just releasing at the moment, is the ability to deploy Roxet inside of your VPC. So this is a really nice feature set in that you can keep the data in your own uh, VPC. It kind of never leaves your environment. Um, and yet the management of the platform, kind of that SaaS aspect, is actually managed um, you know, by Roxet externally. So a really good hybrid approach of, um, you know, the data being in your own environment, full control, security, things of that nature, and still without that kind of operational burden of having to manage such an infrastructure on your own. So uh, pretty excited about that release. And secondly, um, you know, how do things look when we start to think about scaling ingest? Um, so if we look at the kind of Elastic search side of things. Obviously, a lot of this is use case specific, and, and that's really not what we want to go into. You know, um, on the Elastic side, if you're looking at metrics, observability, logging, 
you know, there's a vast array of integrations and technologies for beats and modules and Logstash at which make that really, you know, nice and, and a huge ecosystem. Um, things to think about kind of in, in the ops side of things are, you know, what is that data? How am I going to query that data? And the reason that matters is you need to make sure that you are denormalizing your data accordingly. So, you know, what data goes into what index actually matters. Um, you know, because that then makes you think about, okay, if I'm writing a real-time application, uh, what type of metrics do I need to run? What fields do I need to be able to query? And what happens if that changes later down the line? So things to think about, you know, how do I denormalize that data? And as with many SQL and rock sets alike, you know, what do those type mappings look like? Um, I talked briefly about those on the rock set side of things, but you know, key considerations when you're uh, you know, thinking about ingest. And again, on the kind of the use case specific side, We've, we've talked a little about these connectors and I've, I've shown you a demonstration. So out the box kind of click and connect connectors are really the focus of Rockset um, to make it simple to bring that data into the platform. On the consideration side of things, it's really focused on, as you saw, we, we don't need to denormalize that data. You can literally throw it into the platform in whatever format and still experience kind of that relational representation of the data and then optimize using just SQL. So you can, um, you know, be picking and choosing across all these different data sources that may have different retention policies, um, you know, to, to service your queries in, in real time as you need. And same as Elastic, you need to think about your mapping. So, you know, um, Rockset will imply mappings and ingest time, and you can go in and overwrite those if, if you need to. So when we start moving into kind of the scaling type of thing, so scaling rights, um, <clears throat> what are the implications of that and, and how's that done? Um, you know, on the elastic side of things, there's a, the classic stuff like you've got to think about this space and there's um, you know, all sorts of alerting and monitoring to, to look after these things for you. You may want to look at dedicated ingest nodes when your ingest um, workload gets significant. And I know a lot of people who are um, on this call who are elastic users on premise um, will be, be very familiar with that. So it gives you the ability to kind of split out your, your node types. <clears throat> and then at some point you want to start thinking about, you know, when you're getting to decent scale, how your um, shards are managed. So from an ingest perspective, do you have enough primary shards? Are they spread evenly across your nodes so you're not getting kind of hot nodes um, under significant load? And you may need to sort of you know, tweak and tune that based on you know, re-indexing data around um, to meet that, that change in, in, in shard strategy if needed. And on the Rockset side, um, the way we do this under the covers is we have this concept of kind of micro shards and it's a very, um, uh, very s small, um, you know, fragmented approach. And what that means is that we don't have to move those indexes. They naturally um, resettle themselves across um, a different number of nodes automatically. So you never have any um, operational overhead of sort of supporting that. And the other thing we briefly touched on is all these indexes are fully mutable. So literally every key value is um, is mutable. So for upserts and you know updates, it um, with very high throughput. That's something that's a, a very good fit for Rockset. So the other part of this, and we'll, we'll dig into this in the, in a few moments as well, is um, an efficient use of compute and storage. You know because the compute and the storage are are scaled independently. Um, you know, your your usage, you know, the, the hardware is actually hugs the usage graph. So you're never leaving kind of compute on the table that is not being used or you're leaving storage on the table that is not being used. And that goes for scaling up and scaling down. So I don't have to go and allocate myself, um, you know, a few terabytes worth of storage that I'm not using. You know, that just isn't, um, it's something that's, that's taken care of for you. And we use, um, you know, for these efficiencies on the indexing side, we use um, RocksDB remote compaction. And that allows us to get really good efficiencies from storing these multiple indexes. Um, and then a feature we've got coming soon is the ability to actually query your data on cold storage. Um, so that's not with us at the moment, but um, that's something that's coming in the future where we'll actually be able to drop the data onto S3 and actually run live queries there, which will give you a really nice um, you know, performance um, you know, efficiencies. So that was the sort of ingest side of things. And on the read side of things where, you know, we're dealing with, um, we deal with many customers who have a very high QPS, you know, queries per second requirement where they're running real-time applications um, at scale. And, you know, you need to be able to support this high concurrency with complex queries. 
Um, now, in the Elastic Search side of things, you can simply increase the number of nodes um, or your read replicates. So again, you can scale this up to, to meet those requirements. Um, again, you might want to start thinking about what your shards and a number of replicas actually look like under the covers. Um, you know, you can you can tweak and tune this stuff, and um, you know, you can, as it says here, you know, you potentially have more overhead by having a, a, a smaller, um, you know, more shards. But effectively, if you have a small number of those, you can it may be faster. So, as with a lot of you know distributed systems, a good way of, to, to test this out is actually do it with your own data. You know, ingest the right data and then run your own queries to get that solid, you know, real real performance benchmark. But on the Rockset side of things, we, as we mentioned already, we you know we're decoupling this compute from storage, um, and I've already mentioned the micro shards are rebalanced when you um, when you change this compute. So on the right hand side here, you can see a little screenshot and you know create an account, have a play. You, you'll see this. You can just click a button to literally scale up and scale down, and there's no downtime and it's a very fast operation because of that micro sharding um, implementation. So we. We automatically rebalance this. There's no degradation to performance. There's no degradation, um, you know, to, to storage capacity or anything of that nature. So it really is trivial to scale up and down on, on your compute. Um, and then, just for the essence of time, I know we're we're almost at the end here. Um, let's jump onto this slide where, you know, here here I was working with a customer, and there's actually a full blog article on this, as you can see at the bottom here. Um, where I was working with a customer where we're scaling um, a similar use case where we're just scaling you know, a high number of queries per second uh, coming into the platform. And this was a, a real-time application, a web app and a mobile app. Um, and the query specifically that we were looking at here was actually really expensive um, for any system to perform. And what they did here was, um, you know, we did this sort of basic analysis and said, how fast does this query run? Along the x-axis here, you can see the number of days of kind of historical data that they were querying. So they were going back 30, 60, and 90 days, depending on what that user interaction was. Um, and they were able just to, as, as we just talked about, shift the virtual compute up and down to meet the performance requirements um, uh, you know, and the throughput requirements. So just an example of um, you know, real metrics on a real query that uh, for, for a previous customer or current customer. So final section here, um, looking at the index lifecycle management. Um, so what do we do with data as it as it ages? You know, it becomes potentially less relevant, or maybe it's not so important. And you know, in the logging um, sort of logging side of the world, then that's a really key one where typically you know the last seven days worth of logs are really important to me. But for security and compliance, you want to age this stuff out and, and store it. Um, and Elastic supports the the ILM. Um, set of features where you can migrate data to different types of hardware, uh, depending on sort of the priority and importance of, of that data. And on the sort of cloud front, there's a pre-configured uh, hot warm instance type which will which will take care of that for you. And on the Rockset side of things, we effectively just manage the compute allocated to that data. Um, so kind of on the warm environment, you have hot storage, but it has less compute. So you're just allocating fewer resources to that. Your queries are going to be slower, and obviously then you get a better um, storage to price um, efficiency. And on the cold storage, um, which I mentioned is coming soon, that's actually going to be you know, even less compute and actually querying on S3 directly. Um, so that's really going to be the, the ability to store massive amounts of data, uh, potentially outside of the platform, but still have the ability to query it, which is going to be super powerful. Okay, so with that, um, I'll hand over back to Shruti. Thanks, Ben. That was a, a really, really interesting um, uh, set of slides there. As we go into the final section here, just a reminder, please use the chat window to ask questions. We will take questions in real time here. The uh, design goals we talked about in the beginning, right, we wanted to uh, design a system that gave you a better experience at scale. Now, obviously, you know, Elasticsearch is used at massive scale in a lot of companies and it does perform um, at scale. However, the challenge is when you're operating at that scale, you're trying to you know, get those low latency queries with high velocity ingest and massive data volumes. The biggest challenge is 
around um, operational efficiency, right? How do you operate at that scale? How do you keep your costs low? How do you make sure that you are not wasting uh, resources because it can get really expensive if you're over provisioning resources at that scale? So our whole premise is that we believe that there is a better scaling experience that's possible in the cloud. And that's what we're shooting for, so that you get the performance you need, but you also get it at the price that matters. The second uh, you know, big design goal that we talked about was, hey, in the last few years, we've seen real-time data has changed. We've seen that you, know, you have data coming in many shapes, you have deeply nested data, you have Avro, you have you know, Parquet, XML, and not only has the shape of the data changed, but also the types of applications that need to query this data, they have been changing, right? So how do you get that kind of flexibility where without knowing ahead of time what the shape of your data is, without knowing ahead of time what types of queries you need to run, how can, you give, how can we give you the flexibility to just keep going um, really fast? So our approach there is to give you standard SQL, including joins on semi-structured data. You don't need to denormalize anything. And the final part is what Ben spent a lot of time talking about. How can we give you serverless auto-scaling, right? Decoupling compute and storage is something that um, interestingly enough, you know, Snowflake has talked a lot about in the warehouse market, right? Um, in the warehouse market, when Snowflake first did this in the cloud, it was really interesting because they were able to get, you know, groundbreaking price performance efficiencies. It's very hard to do this in the real time world, right? And this is what Rockset is doing in the real time analytics space. We've been able to decouple compute and storage in the cloud and still give you that low latency uh, real-time experience. And the whole um, point of it is because we can do this in the cloud, we can make it completely serverless. You don't have to, you shouldn't have to manage indexes and shards and clusters and node types, right? You had to do that in the data center world, but now in the cloud, is it really necessary to manage uh, you know, your shards, right? So we take away all of that, still give you a lot of visibility and control into what's happening, but automate the grunt work out of managing that. That's our whole goal. As a result of doing all this, you know, our, our um, you know, eventual goal here is how can we get you faster time to market? Interestingly enough, uh, one of our customers um, you know, just yesterday was sharing that um, they had a particular workload that started failing in production and very quickly they decided to switch that workload over to Rockset and within an hour they were up and running. Like in, in one hour flat they were up and running in production. Um, that sounds a little crazy but you can do that in the cloud. That's important, right? So how can you get faster time to market when you know your developers are running really fast Suddenly you have a roadmap requirement, you have to support this new feature. How can you get up and running really fast? That's important. And then on the TCO side, because of all of this cloud efficiency, we have seen up to 50% lower TCO. Um, of course, it all depends on your use case, your scale, how you're operating it, but that's the goal, isn't it? To be able to get to you know, a much, much better cost model because of the efficiency you can get in the cloud. So I'll stop here and uh, switch over to questions. Also, in the meantime, Ben, if you want to switch to the last slide, um, we want to open it up for Q&A and tell you about our community channel where we will hang out for a few more minutes after the session and we'll continue to take um, questions over the Slack community. In the meantime, um, Julie, do you have any questions coming in? I do. I do have a couple questions coming in. Um, so one is, are there any plans to support protobuf data from the schema query flexibility perspective? Ben, do you want to take this one? Yeah, I don't know if it's a roadmap item off the top of my head. I can um, we can find out, but uh, there's a number of ways. Um, so I assume you know, the, the question is obviously directly into to Rockset as a as a native interface. So 
At the moment, no, but I don't know about the roadmap, whether that's uh, something we're looking at. There are obviously multiple ways you can kind of architect to support that, but, but not like a native integration today. Okay, and then the next question is, does Rockset support transactional OLTP workloads and how do you compare it to something like CockroachDB? Yeah, so it's not, um, so Elastic, sorry, Rockset is not a, a transactional system. Um, and what we do typically is, you know, the transactional systems are really good at doing what they do, right? Running transactions and we effectively pull data that you want to query or offload that, uh, that read workload into Rockset. And that's really those change data capture streams that we mentioned. So we see customers all the time that are running things like um, Postgres and MySQL and SQL Server, and they get to a point where the data ingest is really starting to affect their query performance, or they've just in general sort of met the limits of what they can do with um, you know, those types of systems. And that's a really good use case for, you know, we call it transactional offloading, where they, whereby they, they take the reads, the complex queries, um, and actually run those on Rockset and keep the transactional side of things running on, on those platforms like Postgres. And if you're powering or ingesting data into those systems, um, it's very easy to then push it straight into Rockset as well. Or as we've already mentioned, you can take a, a change data capture stream from that transactional system and directly push that into Rockset. So you get the best of both worlds. Transaction systems doing what it does best, and then you can offload all your reads and scale that up to kind of cloud levels um, you know, in Rockset. And if I can add to that, one way to think about it is um, in the real world, imagine Amazon.com, right? Your shopping cart would absolutely be on your transactional database, right? That's where you need very high consistency and you absolutely want your transactions to support your shopping cart. And then everything else like product recommendations, like, um, you know, personalization, like, you know, um, inventory from third party sellers, like all of that would live in a different system. And you can imagine something like Rockset powering that. So we do not support transactions. And that is really the trade off here. We are an indexing database. We do not support transactions. Great, keep the questions coming. Um, here's another one. What are the main differences be between Lucene and RocksDB? Yeah, that's a, <clears throat> a big question, but just at a high level, I think um, RocksDB is effectively a key value store. So as we use it within Rockset, we, you know, we actually slice up all of that data and store it into um, a set format, which is you know, key values in, in this case. On the Lucene side of things, um, you know, effectively, you're creating an inverted index. That's what it's doing under the covers. And the way it actually takes data out of memory and pushes it down to disk is, is very, very different. So um, they're very different systems. And you know, typically, you'll see uh, Elastic's kind of the best example of where, you know, of Lucene is you know, those fast textual search lookups, whereas RocksDB's use case outside of Rockset are actually much, much broader. It's a, you know, a, a general key value store. Um, so yeah, pretty high level, I'm afraid, but uh, but they're quite different in, in those respects. Great. Those are all the questions that we're going to take for now. As Shruti did mention, we will be hanging out in the Rockset community. So please join us there um, and we'll be taking any additional questions through that forum. Great, thanks everyone. Thank you for joining us and uh, we'll see you over on the community channel. Thanks. Thanks, everyone.